So welcome to the second, uh, if I count it correctly, to the second session on uh, game AI. Um, actually, we have four papers in this um, session. And uh, I heard that we have videos for the second and for the fourth paper. So I, I hope that uh, Jeppe is there already. Um, and I'm here, yeah. Uh, you are going to present the first paper, I guess? Yes. So that is on strategies for using proximal, proximal policy optimization in mobile puzzle games. I guess it has to do with deep learning, right? Yes. So, so please just go ahead. All right. Uh, is, does it look fine on Zoom? Yes, it looks good. All right. good. Perfect. So, uh, yes, um, I will talk about uh, using proximal policy optimization for mobile puzzle games. And uh, I'm Jebe, and it's, this is a project that is in collaboration with uh, Tactile Games and the IT University, and it's a part of uh, some of the PhD studies that I'm doing. Um, so, first, I just want to give some background on why this is interesting and why we took this approach to begin with. Um, and one reason is that automated plate testing tools, they're becoming more and more common now in the industry. Uh, for example, for tactile games that I will be working on one of their games, or I will talk about one of their games, Lily's Garden here. Um, one of the use cases for these tools is difficulty estimation of the levels. So being able to Autom uh, automatically estimate the difficulty is something that can save the level designers a lot of time when they go through this uh, process of finding out the difficulty. Um, also, when we look at more uh, other, to other companies that are using this, uh, this, these tools are becoming more democratized uh, with uh, tools like Unity ML agents where Basically, if you have your game in Unity, you can quite easily fire up some kind of reinforcement learning or whatever to create intelligent agents to test your game. But even though this is, these approaches uh, are popular, it's also difficult to get them right. So if you don't have uh, a lot of time to fine tune or uh, work on these problems, it's actually difficult to make sure that you learn uh, uh, something useful um, and even though so i will be use, uh, talking about using proximal policy optimization which is something that you know ensures that you don't take too large uh, steps in your in updating your policy it's still difficult to ensure or there are some th some pitfalls when you use it that you end up with something that is not uh, yeah usable in the end so what i want to answer in this paper is basically how can we avoid learning these catastrophic policies, or at least strategies for avoiding this. Um, so I will talk overall on about three different strategies that we tested in this paper. One is color shuffling, which is, uh, I think it's uh, something that is pretty uh, obvious to many here. and. But it's still a, you know, worthwhile to see how does this affect the training. And by color shuffling in this case, uh, I have shown how we represent the game here. And we have six different colors. Um, wait, sorry. I... Ah, yeah, okay, I just saw the chat, sorry. Um, so I will just continue. So this is the way that we represent the the game we represent it by basically mechanics so we have the colors of the board pieces in this puzzle game that we're looking at and some other aspects and since the colors don't really mean anything uh, only that uh, the colors are you know the same we can basically swap red with green and it shouldn't really affect the game so this is what we employ. And in a way, it's a kind of like procedural content generation or data augmentation of the data, but it's also something that is necessary if we want to use this for a level designer that they don't have to worry about, did I use a blue tile here? And I know it's bad for blue. So it's something that we uh, try to see the effect of. The second one is early resetting uh, or basically putting a time limit to the um, the training and 
it's also something that is uh, common in literature. If you have an, the agent exploring down some route that is not very useful, you can stop the training early and see how that helps. Lastly, we also consider using an action mask. And here I want to differentiate between a soft and hard action mask. By soft, I mean we basically include it in the observation space here, uh, but we still allow the agent to take invalid moves, even though it doesn't really change the board, but it tries to do it and it's still a transition. Uh, the hard action mask is something that modifies the policy, so the invalid moves are yeah, trunk or you know, uh, put to zero, so you avoid taking that action completely. Um, so the way we want to explore these strategies is we use our custom environment of Lily's Garden, where we give rewards for taking, uh, or for completing the levels and com gathering the the collect goals in this. But then we also give it a penalty if it tries to take an invalid move, or uh, for every step that it takes to encourage it to finish faster. We also use a, you know, proximal policy optimization where first, if you just, uh, because we will be talking about a, a bit of a hyperparameter tuning. So uh, one thing is that you have this clipped loss, uh, yeah, function that is uh, something related to PPO. And secondly, you also have this entropy, uh, uh, bonus or so the more the higher entropy your actions uh, or your policy is the yeah better so this is something to encourage more exploration which is something that we try to play around with due to something that happened during training and lastly the way we, we want to evaluate this is both by training stability and how good the agent becomes in the end and uh we have a we use a deep learning setup, so we have a convolutional neural network here where we have our input space, and then we do uh, what is it three convolutions with a two by two kernel. Um, that is what we saw was working fine to begin with, and uh, uh, this is what we use in the following. So what we do is uh, we only consider the first. Uh, 11 levels, but we have the full game mechanic uh, of Lily's Garden working. Uh, so what we do is for the training, we only consider the, these uneven levels um, up to level nine. Um, and then we use the others to evaluate agent performance and ability to generalize. And we run these experiments with a baseline where we we only change the entropy coefficient uh, and then we add uh, as we go uh, color shuffling we add the reset uh, method and we add the hard and uh, yeah hard and soft action mask uh, and then also because the training can run for a long time we also evaluate it at the early and or early versus late in the training process so that is what we do here we say we have i have put here at what time step we evaluate our agent just to see if the checkpointed model changes. <clears throat> so what we see when it comes to the training stability at first, if we look at the learning curves, they look like this. Um, so we have the baselines here uh, and uh, yeah, the others, uh, this is just a zoomed in view of this one. So just to uh, give an overview of what we see here is that the entropy coefficient is not enough to learn uh, a bad policy. Uh, so that is the baseline models. They all seem to learn some policy or something, it encounters something in the training that leads to really bad learning. And uh, what we see is that this happens when the policy entropy becomes very low. So basically only one action is taken and somehow this action is invalid. Uh, somehow it is invalid, but it ends up being stuck on that. And it has uh, basically just gotten stuck on something. Um, you can also add color shuffling with the high entropy coefficient, which uh, is the red and purple here. And it seems to help a bit, but it still ends up uh, uh, leading to the same behavior uh, where it gets stuck on something. So that's why then maybe resetting. So now it has been stuck on this, let's reset it. So that is the 
<coughs> sorry, uh, that is the brown, yellow, and gray. And actually, that seems to be something that stabilizes the training uh, a lot. Um, you avoid, uh, basically, when it gets stuck, you avoid gathering only bad transitions. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, seems to allow it to uh, diversify the learning a bit. So uh, it doesn't just continuously train on one level that it finds really difficult, but constantly picks uh, levels that diversifies the learning. <clears throat> and then, but interestingly enough, what we also see is that the hard action mask, uh, the gray one here, it starts out learning pretty well, but it ends up with some kind of failure as well later uh, or quite early. Um, and this could be due to having an imperfect mask. It's not something that we get from the simulator, but something from the game itself. Um, but uh, that is something that uh, could be also due to uh, the way that the, the learning with an action mask actually affects, or having an action mask actually affects the learning. Um, and then lastly, using a soft action mask, the yellow here, uh, so where we include it in the observation space, the mask, it speeds up training a lot. So if you compare the yellow with the brown, the only difference is the soft action mask in the observation space. And sure, you have more information, so it should learn faster. Um, but uh, it also, uh, well, it learns faster, but it seems to reach the same level of competence uh, overall. So uh, yeah, that seems to be a pretty strong strategy also. Um, if we look at the agent performance, what we see is that the, um, uh, if we look at the competence, how good is it that picking valid moves, uh, the less training, so the standard, uh, the baselines that didn't, they were not able to train for a long time, they become less competent. So they end up picking a invalid uh, move more often. So here we have the training levels in white background and the gray shaded in, as the evaluation. And you can see that it tends to be around every second move that is valid. So it, they don't seem to learn exactly how to pick a valid move, except when we um, let it train for longer. Uh, secondly, the color shifting doesn't seem to affect the uh, general generality so much. Uh, so when uh, if you look at the purple here, which is basically the baseline with color shuffling, it seems to be kind of the same regardless. So uh, it seems to have similar performance. The hard action mask during this evaluation, we don't allow it to use the action mask and the competence of the agent is actually very low. So the, the hard action mask agent actually doesn't really get to uh, reach a good, uh, it, it doesn't learn how to pick valid moves. Uh, and lastly, longer training is not necessarily a good way to learn a efficient way to learn a good policy. So if you compare the yellow and the blue, uh, the blue is the later, uh, the one that has been trained for longer, and it actually seems to kind of overfit or not really reach the same level of competency. Um, I also want to talk about the move distributions, but it's basically the same story. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that now. Um, so to sum up now, what we, um, uh, what we then see from our experiments is that these three strategies, they work well in combination. They all, uh, they don't uh, deteriorate on the learning really. So it's something that can be used uh, together. Uh, resetting seems to have the largest impact. So that seems to be a pretty strong strat strategy. If you're stuck, just allow the agent to train for a bit until resetting, yes. And uh, lastly, the agent with a hard uh, action mask also needs it uh, during evaluation. And also uh, you can reach both sub and superhuman performance on the agent as we saw in the move distributions. Um, so um, it seems to be, if you do, if you use these strategies, you seem to, you can reach an agent, but just for future work, we need to include more levels, maybe, find out which levels we need to train on that it struggles with, and probably also how we fi figure out how we use a hard action mask. 
uh, properly. And there is some recent work on this uh, that I didn't uh, include in the paper, but uh, it's uh, uh, something about how to probably propagate the, the uh, yeah, gradients that you get from the uh, policy uh, when you truncate the probabilities. And yeah, with that, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey, for this nice talk. Um, I think we don't, yeah, we, uh, I already see it. Uh, we are a bit over time, um, so we don't have too much time. Maybe one quick question, um, and maybe you can answer that also quickly. Um, how, how can you actually do the restart? I mean, uh, how do you know when to restart? Um, so, right, okay. Uh, in the restart, restart strategy now, I just use uh, around 100 steps in an environment. So I know around, you need around 50 steps to finish the level uh, on average. So I just put a maximum of 100, so two times the move limit. Uh, you can be more clever about this, uh, I'm sure, but uh, this just seems to be the easiest and you know, just put some kind of time limit that still allows it to explore and finish. It works, it's not stupid, right? Um, so uh, thank I, you I very much. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, we have to conclude and uh, go to the next, uh, I'm sorry. Um, so for everybody else who has questions, please uh, take them to Discord as uh, David already wrote. And so let's switch to the next paper, please. So the next paper oh. is about yeah. Collaborative agent gameplay in the pandemic board game. And I think we have a video that is played, right? Yes, that's correct. Hello, everyone. My name is Antonios Lapis, and I'm here to talk about the paper Collaborative Agent Gameplay in the Pandemic Board Game, co authored with Kostantinos Fikas, a master's student at the Institute of Digital Games. Now, we all know that board game play has been a focus of artificial intelligence research since the beginning is of the field. And actually what most people think of when they think of artificial intelligence is a computer beating an expert player in games such as chess, Go, etc. However, competitive play is not the only way that board games are played. Modern board games um, actually often focus around collaboration where all players work together to defeat um, the board, which is essentially a finite game state which increases the challenge as the turns progress. What we're focusing on here is applying a rolling horizon evolutionary algorithm to control all the players in the pandemic game, which is strangely appropriate in the current times. Now I'm going to go through some um, general rules of pandemic, but this is not a how to play tutorial. So pandemic is a board game played on a world map, which has 48 cities connected in a graph. These cities are infected with disease cubes and which city gets infected is determined semi-randomly. I'll touch upon this later. Players take the role of um, researchers and medics and they try to collect a set of same color city cards in order to cure the four different diseases. However, the uh, game ends if the world is overrun with disease or when time runs out. Players take on different roles that slightly change what actions they have available to them. But in general, each player has four actions per turn, and these are move actions that allow them to move around the world in different ways. Um, they can remove a cube in the current city, thus reducing the risk of the world being overrun with disease. They can cure disease, which brings them closer to winning, and they can exchange a card with another player as long as the card is of the same city as, the, as both players um, are in. After this is, um, these four actions take place, the player draws two city cards, thus, thus uh, en enlarging their hand, um, and also infects a number of cities. This number increases as the turns progress. So the world becomes more infected, but the player also has more um, cards at their disposal. However, an epidemic may occur which will cause all the previously infected cities to be reshuffled and placed on top of the deck. That means that previously infected cities will get worse before new cities start getting infected. Now, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, Rolling Horizon controller. Um, first of all, let's talk about RHEA in general. 
our HEA involves a sequence of actions to maximize some sort of quality uh, of the game state when these actions are all taken. So we evaluate the end game state um, after all the actions are taken, but we only perform the first action of the first individual. When we need to choose our next action, we start from scratch. Now for pandemic specifically, uh, we control all the players, so we evolve the sequence of all actions of all players, um, concatenating them into the uh, action sequence. We see here at the bottom an example. However, after each player's turn, they draw cards, they also infect cities, so the game state changes stochastically. So um, future uh, players' turns may become invalid. You cannot go and treat a disease in London if London was not infected in the previous turn. Um, and there's an interesting question about whether you want to avoid losing or try to go for winning, and we'll talk about that soon as well. Now, because Pandemic, as most collaborative board games, is fairly complex, we had to simplify it substantially. One step was to um, keep the distribution of cards the same when performing random rollouts. So when we're trying to simulate the, um, the effect of the action sequences being evolved, we kept track of which stacks have been placed on which, um, uh, on which deck. For example, when an epidemic occurs, we place all the previously infected cities on top of the deck. We keep track of which cities these are, we shuffle them only within that substack, and then shuffle the rest of the cities, and thus we gain the same distribution when we're performing our evaluation. We also um, had to simplify the actions because there's a lot of actions, there's many different ways in which you can travel the globe. So we essentially concatenated uh, move actions with the action that you perform at the final city. For example, when you treat disease, the treat disease macro action, you have a number of move actions um, that take you to the city um, we only test cities that have a disease cube, and then you perform one treat action on that city, etc., etc. Now, as I mentioned before, there's two different ways of seeing the problem. One is how close you are to winning, which is the number of cure disease or your ability to cure disease based on the cards on your hand. And the other one is a pessimistic one, how close you are to losing the game. And there's many different ways that you can lose the game. So we evaluate how many disease cubes are remaining off the board, because if you run out, the game is lost, and the number of outbreaks. If you reach eight outbreaks, the game ends. To talk about our specific RHE implementation, we use a one plus one evolutionary algorithm. That means that we have one individual, we create a mutant, we compare between the two, and then we keep the best one. And this uh, continues. Now what's important is that we initialize our individual with a default policy hierarchical agent. That essentially has a well-crafted order of things to do. So for example, if you have uh, the required number of cards to cure disease, then do it. Afterwards, if, you, if there's a, a city with three disease cubes nearby, go and treat it. So we have this kind of uh, list, and we go through it in order. That's how our initial seed is formed. However, we apply mutations on the macro actions of, an, of, um, of a player and we use a different version of a hierarchical agent where the priority of the actions is randomized. Uh, finally, after, um, after the mutation, the next actions um, that the player has to take um, are repaired using, again, the default policy. So a visual example is this. We have five um, players' turns. That's the limit of our horizon. These, only, uh, these can have different number of macro actions each, so we are talking about a variable length chromosome. And here we see that at gene two, uh, we have chosen randomly to mutate. We choose again a random macro action. We create a new one with a mutator agent. And then because there's more actions to take, we use the creator agent, the default policy, to uh, decide the next macro action. The remaining players actions remain the same, so that is not changed. Now, in terms of our results, we performed a number of experiments. There's more details in the paper, but I want to focus on the um, core findings here. 
So we use the controlled set based on experiments with um, the default policy agent. We found a number of games which cluster them so that we include both easy games, hard games, long games, short games, and we uh, have a set of 10 initial game states, including the exact um, deck order and um, CD locations. When we perform experiments with one fitness, we actually experimented with different variants of this fitness, so including a win-loss condition. You get one if you win, you get the fitness if the game is ongoing, and you get zero if you lose. And another version which had one if you win, the fitness um, when the game is ongoing, and a portion of the fitness when the game is lost. So there's different degrees of losing. The best results were with the optimistic agent, unsurprisingly, because they actually um, tried to win. What is interesting as well is that uh, pessimistic agents tended to lose only because the game uh, ran out of cards. So they were better at defending, they led to longer games, but they were just not very good at finding um, cures. When we combined the two fitnesses into a simple sum, um, we found our best solution to be the one that optimizes um, the ability to cure diseases and the number of disease cubes um, left off the board, which had a 30% uh, win ratio versus 8.5% of the default policy, our baseline. Now, just to sum up, um, I think that collaborative board game play has some interesting challenges for AI because it's less about anticipating the other player, trying to minimize their gains while maximizing your own, and it's more about coordinating different abilities, different player roles, and also balancing winning versus losing. In order to do this, we have to abstract away the game system because there's a lot of complexity, but this can also bias our strategies. So due to the way it was, um, uh, the hierarchical policy was designed, exchanging cards was quite difficult because you needed to have both players at the same city. Um, we found that Rolling Horizon Evolutionary Algorithm, due to the distribution and the rollouts, it could actually anticipate the game state better um, but if we were to perform more experiments, we would play around with more freeform macros to have less control. And also, since we saw that uh, optimizing for, for both optimistic and pessimistic approaches performed best, a multi-objective solution would probably perform even better. And that's pretty much it. Thank you for your time, and I hope you have questions. Hi, uh, really cool work. And uh, I was wondering exactly about this thing that you discussed on the last slide about coordination. And I think the biggest coordination in pandemic is like uh, when you have to decide the, to go to a, to, a, to a city so that the other player can meet you there and take a card. And because the algorithm you, show, you, you, you chose uh, computes everything from scratch, was there a risk that the agents might uh, like one agent might think it's a good idea to meet and the other might not respond that. And how would you see that playing also between humans? I know it's a very broad question, but like well, if you human wanted, question. <laughs> wanted to, to cooperate with this AI, with this bot. Um, future work. Um, yeah. <laughs> this, was, um, this was the most, uh, the most difficult part. And if you're, if you're familiar with pandemic, this is how you win. You win by basically sharing cards. And this is why we even like 30% is great, but um, we could have gotten a lot better if we could find a way to share knowledge uh, more efficiently. That happened a lot. What you're saying, I don't have you know, stats, but we, had, we were thinking about having a flag that says I'm waiting for something because you could also just sit there, wait, lose your actions, which you could spend for something else because you wanted to stay in that city and the other person could just go away. We generally, in our default policy, we tend to prioritize if someone is waiting for you go there, um, but it didn't always happen, right? So we would need maybe a macro that basically combined both uh, players' actions together, but that would, yeah, but there's many different problems with that, uh, as well as, you know, we completely ignored the dispatcher because it's also hard to move other players as well. Um, in terms of um, the um, playing with other humans, um, that the only problem there is that you need to explain to them your plan. Um, so it's a matter of explainability. 
It's not hard because you have the micro action, so you can say, go to that city and do that thing. But whether they agree or not, or whether they want to provide an, an alternative, um, that's harder. So like, you know, one way communication of, explain, of explaining is fine. How to get the human to change the priorities of the, of the agents. That's an interesting question that we probably would need more time to brainstorm about. I think that there's uh, time for one last question, and uh, Diego already posed one question. Did you settle from the start on, uh, on a one plus one EA, or did you try a population-based EA beforehand? Um, we are working on that now, um, especially because we're trying experiments with uh, multi-objective, and uh, one plus one is a very nice and cheap way to, to do multi-objective, but it's not bound to work very well. Um, so we're working on that now. We haven't had amazing um, results because um, the, the problem is you're trying to simulate many actions and then things change midway through. So if you have multiple population, many individuals and they all have a different rollout, um, that the situation on the board might change drastically. So we would probably have to lower the horizon uh, because we found that we have five with three, we get pretty good results as well. So in, in that case, I would try to lower how far down the line you're going, like how far down the world's destruction you want to go down um, before you evaluate. So um, yes, we're trying this, but we basically tried one plus one first, uh, and now we're trying to fix what you're suggesting. Okay, thanks for the answer. I think we have to move on. I'd, I'd have a ton of questions, but uh, next paper is presented by uh, Conor, I guess. Uh, so it's about assessing multiplayer level design using deep learning techniques. So please, Connor, when you're ready, just go ahead. Is that visible? Perfect. Uh, my name is Connor Stevens. Uh, I'll be presenting today on the paper assessing multiplayer level design using uh, deep learning techniques. Um, I'm a PhD student in UL Ireland, um, and those are the contact info if you need them. So this project's all open source. It's about evaluating game design uh, in multiplayer games. One of the example games is this top-down shooter, which is based off the top-down engine, which is an asset on the asset store. We've used ML agents to train agents in this environment and we've generated a neural network that can kind of predict the fairness of a level uh, using generated results from the agents. So it uses Unity, ML Agents, and Barracuda, which is um, Unity's library for inferring things from neural networks. So we kind of wanted to predict the fairness of a given level design. So we wanted to measure, uh, to predict the win rate of a specific player um, spawn within an asymmetric le level with similarly skilled players. Um, the balance in these levels come from the asymmetric design, so this is a square. I'll go through the how we design levels next. Um, and uh, the, the, the actual positions of the players when they start off and where they can move to relatively easily. So the game is a 2D top-down shooter. Each player has a projectile-based weapon, as you saw. Uh, it's deathmatch mode, so if you defeat the player, you'll, you win, um, and the agent receives the reward of one. Uh, if you lose, you get you, you lose and minus one, and we have a little timer in case there's like a standoff, and then it's a reward of zero. Uh, players can kind of use the corners of the level as kind of uh, cover, so they can kind of block themselves away from the opponent and kind of win that way. It, the, each playable character can move, aim, and shoot. Um, and I went through the rule sets earlier, but there's health packs in the level uh, that restore HP. They're single use for a single game. So to kind of generate the data, we decided to use procedural content generation to design loads of loads of uh, different levels. Um, we settled on how nuclear throne works they published their design of their procedural content generation uh, as a part of a games jam uh, and it's a big game by blambeer um, the floors of the level are decided defined by having random walks and spawning and destroying random walks uh, procedurally based off a seed 
and walls surround all the uh, empty floors. Uh, the spawn points are then uh, the two maximum distance spaces between the uh, within the available space, and then we put health packs as far away as possible. So this is kind of the uh, process of the procedural generation. Um, the code is actually available um, here for how to do it, and uh, there's a good YouTube video if you want to learn more. These are kind of the outputs of our procedural generation, with the red dots being health packs. Um, perfect. These agents were trained using ML agents. Uh, we use self-play to allow us to have an upwards reward signal. So the graph here is basically uh, the performance of the agent over time when compared to the original, which is, was a random policy. So this is the skill rating, like the ELO skill rating, and this is the number of agent steps on the uh, x-axis. The graph is smoothed because there's, um, there was parallel training, so there's like 30 different levels at any one stage of this approach. Um, so these are the learning agents. They have 36 raycasts. They can capture what is kind of coming out of the player and what's uh, interacting with them. They also have a tile map sensor which pictures the entire level as a uh, stacked matrix. Um, perfect. Um, we trained the agents and then we ran the agents in uh, the trained models in an environment to generate data. Um, this data was seen as the uh, both the training data and the labels for a convolutional neural network, which we developed in Keras, a uh, Python framework, um, and trained using Keras. Um, so this is kind of the representation of the input for the uh, Keras model. Um, and we're trying to predict this output, which is the win rate for the first player. The three yellow points are spawns, and the two greens are the different, uh, uh, the, the yellow points are the health packs, and the green points are the spawns. Uh, this data comprises of 10,000 different maps based off of which each have a unique random seed, and we've played 1,000 automated games in each map. Um, the training data is 2D matrix, uh, we just save as a CSV, and the labels are the win rates. So we train this model, and then we've actually put it into an editor script. So all the previous work results in this little editor script, which uh, is a Unity tool for development, so it doesn't get packaged in a final game. And what this editor script does is it allows us to input the neural trained neural network, which is this level prediction neural network, and uh, put in the accessor for the uh, uh, tile map. So if uh, it just looks at the tile map asset and converts it to a 2D array, uh, and we just have a little bit of text that says the current win rate. Uh, this is pretty much real time. We have no real profiling, uh, but it's almost instantaneous to use, and it's really, really nice. Um, these are my references. Um, any questions? Thank you. Sorry if I was a little quick. It's a little nervous. Yeah, thanks a lot, Conor, for, for the nice talk. Um, anybody has a question, you can just unmute yourself. And Go ahead. Um, if there's no question, I'd, I'd like to refer to the uh, beginning of the talk, uh, where actually you have uh, uh, an asymmetric map situation and you want to um, to decide if if it is fair. So that is actually very related to balancing, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's uh, my, my PhD is currently about uh, predicting game balance. Uh, so things like intrans intransitive mechanics and economies. This is about balancing specific level designs for uh, team games, especially if there's like an attacking and defending team like in Overwatch, we can kind of assess how fair that would be um, uh, before releasing on the player base by, and we can actually build that into a tool so designers can see how fair or certain at, different attributes in the future uh, their level is while they're making it. So that's kind of the end result is game balance tools for uh, level designers or game designers for mechanics. And you can see there and then what the predictions are. Yeah, I have also certain experience 
experience with uh, with Starcraft maps balancing actually, and there people always said when when it's asymmetric, it cannot be balanced anyway. Uh, but but your your things are your games are uh, by design asymmetric, right? So you cannot avoid that. Yeah, uh, uh, the, there's more asymmetric games now, uh, and I think it's more about kind of like define designers being able to define what kind of balance they would like. Like Overwatch has it, so both teams should have a no more than a 10% difference in odds to win. Uh, but doing that with skill rating requires an awful lot of uh, player data um, that may not be possible in smaller games or uh, in incremental updates to content. Okay, cool. Is there, is there another question or something? We could have one quick question. Oh. But uh, I, I, I'll, po I'll post the one in the chat to the person looking for the GitHub link. Yeah, that uh, was. It's, uh, pr it's pretty good. There's a YouTube video going through it. Uh, we kind of refactored it to uh, work a little better with Unity, so it has collision and stuff. Okay, if there's no more question, uh, thanks again, Connor. And, awesome. Uh, we'll go to the next talk, for which we actually have a video, I heard. So that's about uh, generating real time strategy. Height maps using cellular automata. Hello, I'm Peter Ziegler from the University of Würzburg and together with Sebastian von Mammen I wrote a paper on generating real-time strategy height maps using cellular automata. Real-time strategy is a subgenre of strategy video games in which your goal is to extract resources, construct buildings and create units which can be deployed to attack and defeat your opponent. The layout of an RTS map determines which strategies are viable. So competitive RTS matches are usually fought on one of a small number of pre-selected high-quality maps. In order to be competitive, players must then memorize viable tactics for each map in the pool. However, this leads to the memorization of viable strategies for each map in the pool being more important than strategic thinking. We want to shift the focus back to strategic thinking by playing each game on a new, unique map. Of course, creating such a huge number of high-quality maps by hand is infeasible, and that's why we have to automate the task, which can be done through procedural generation. There are many pre-existing height map generation techniques which could be considered to generate RTS height maps. First, there's different types of value noise like midpoint displacement and the diamond square algorithm, which we didn't use because they exhibit quite a few directional artifacts. Then there's point-based noise like whirly noise, which generates nice looking height maps, although they are filled with cell-like structures, which makes them unusable for RTS gameplay. Finally, there's gradient noise like Perl noise and simplex noise, which was used in quite a few games to generate nice looking height maps, although these height maps exhibit some patterns, which we don't want on our RTS maps. Real-time strategy maps pose unique challenges which have to be solved. They integrate distinct terrain types such as water, land and plateaus. Such a terrain could be achieved by applying various filters to aforementioned techniques, however this causes undesirable patterns and artifacts. For example, if we use filters on terrain generated by gradient noise, one terrain type, for example mountains, is always being surrounded by the next lower terrain type, in this case plateaus. To solve these challenges we developed a new technique based on cellular automata. Normally, the state of a cell in the next generation is always determined by the same never-changing rule. Instead of using a static rule to determine cell states, we propose to apply several different deterministic or stochastic rules sequentially. We also allow for subdivision of the grid where each cell becomes four new cells. The new cells st then inherit the previous cell's states. Cellular automata rules in combination with additional modifiers can be used to design unique generative sequences which make for interesting RTS maps. To create different height levels, multiple cellular automata grids are stacked on top of each other. This new technique exhibits some directional artifacts while generating very unique maps. Let's now have a look at how this technique works in detail. We use a 2D lattice grid with four von Neumann neighbors. Missing neighbors at the edge of the grid are assumed to have the same state as the considered cell. To define our rule set, we count the active neighbors of a given cell, which results in 10 possible states for a cell and its neighbors to be in. 
For every state we define if the cell will be active in the next generation, like it can be seen in the example deterministic rule on the right. To create stochastic rules we define the probability for the cell being active instead, like it can be seen in the example stochastic rule. Now let's have a look at an example rule. This example rule causes all inactive cells which have one or more active neighbors to turn on with 50% probability. You can see the definition of this rule in the table on the right. We apply this rule to an 8 times 8 cell example grid with some active cells. Intermittent subdivisions are used to gradually increase the level of detail. Following the sequence of alternatingly subdividing, applying the example rule, subdividing and applying the example rule again. And as you can see in the example below, this already results in interesting patterns. We deployed the new technique to build our RTS map generator. The generator is comprised of six components. Layout generation, erosion simulation, marker generation, detail generation, texturing and export, which all generate symmetric outputs. The implementation of these components may vary slightly from game to game, but follows the same principles. We chose Supreme Commander as an example game because it allows its players to use a wide array of strategies. The map layout is generated with the new technique using a predefined sequence of rules which yield a grid for each terrain layer. The grids are seafloor, which is marked in blue, land, marked in dark green, low plateau, marked in green, high plateau, marked in light green, and mountains, marked in grey. These grids are then converted into a height map with set heights for each grid. The base height of the map is 5, the height of the seafloor is 20, and all following grids are always 5 higher than the previous grid. We set the water height to 22, resulting in all terrain which is lower than this value to be underwater. Finally, we use thermal erosion to smooth out the resulting height map. Once the height map is finished, we generate additional features. Markers for the starting locations are placed, resources are distributed and we also add details such as rocks and trees on the map for decoration. This uses mostly simple constraints such as minimum distance between the markers and maximum steepness of the terrain where they are placed. All markers and props are mirrored to ensure the map is perfectly symmetric. Then textures are applied based on the underlying terrain type. Finally, all generated data is saved to the game's file format and you can see an example output map on the right. To evaluate our procedurally generated maps in comparison to user-created maps, 30 Supreme Commander players were questioned. To make sure that each participant knew the game well, they had to have played over 50 matches against other players. Players then played 3 vs 3 matches on generated maps. All matches were supervised to ensure that they were finished without issues like bugs, lags or disconnect. And after the game, each participant filled out a survey with two questions each about fun, novelty, aesthetics, balance and competitiveness. All questions could be answered with one of five options on a Likert scale. So, what did we find out? Whether the map is procedurally generated or user created doesn't impact fun. However, unsurprisingly, fun was impacted by whether the players win or lose. Novelty was rated high and players reported that they were able to experiment with new strategies. Aesthetics, however, were rated low in comparison to user-created maps, with players commenting on repetitive textures and the lack of handcrafted details. Players perceived generated maps as more balanced than user-created maps, mostly because of their perfect symmetry. Competitiveness was rated OK, with some players stating that they would like to play procedurally generated maps in a competitive setting as soon as aesthetics were improved. There are many additions and features which could still be explored. Other neighborhood definitions, like the Moore neighborhood or more than two cell states, may result in new and interesting patterns or performance improvements. Subdivision could be extended to allow cells of different sizes to coexist on the same grid, which may also increase performance. And of course, details and texturing could be improved, for example even by using prefabricated details to increase aesthetics. This concludes the presentation. If you have further questions or are interested in this project, feel free to write me an email. Or you can also just ask questions right now because I'm here in the Zoom call. So please just go ahead if you have any questions. Uh, I was un unfortunately, I was disconnected several times during this uh, talk, so I, I didn't see everything, but what I saw, uh, I liked very much. Yeah, really cool work. 
um, if you can hear me. Uh, when, you, when you showed us the example uh, generator, you could see that the, the initial state had a pretty heavy bearing on what came out of it. And I may have missed this in the talk, but how did you choose the initial state for the maps that you were generating? So the initial state is chosen completely randomly. So we just have uh, a chance for every cell to be active, and then we create the initial pattern based on this. Cool. Have you considered alternate starting states slightly more deterministic, or I guess that would take the uh, some of the randomness out of it? Well, I've experimented with something which I call hybrid maps, where I draw the initial state by hand and then see what happens after that. And that's quite cool because you have lots of control over the type of map which, uh, which you get that way. Yeah, oh, that's really neat. Cool, thank you. Hi, uh, sorry if you covered this, but uh, where did you get the hand-drawn maps? Uh, which ones? The human-generated maps you said the, for the comparison? Ah, uh, yeah. So there's a pretty big uh, community for Supreme Commander, which uh, creates lots of user-created uh, user maps. And uh, I just took the most um, liked user-created maps uh, for comparison. Is this was based on ratings in the community? Yes, exactly. Thanks. I have got a question. Uh, carry on. Okay, so my question is, uh, have you thought about what the aesthetic of a, a good map should be from your generator? So you've actually got an interesting sort of generation process. My question is, how do you direct that towards something that's aesthetically directable? So like if a human designer was going to design something of a similar kind of... Um, density, how do you get towards the human designed aspect of it? So yeah, very good question. Um, with this uh, generation process, you have uh, lots of impact on what's actually happening. Because as someone who's uh, designing the generative sequence, which outputs the map, you can like uh, go ahead and, and change parameters and change rules at every step of the way. And I believe that this is ultimately the key to give the map somewhat of a human touch, which players are looking for. But I don't, I don't know yet if it's actually achievable to get maps which look uh, artistically pleasing enough without including something like prefabricated user-created details. So yeah, I'm, I'm still looking into that. Um, hi, great talk. Um, you said early in the talk that you rejected Worley noise, um, but I'm curious uh, because of the, the cell like structure. But I'm curious if you considered um, uh, combining that with the simplex noise at any point to get your um, cells. So yeah, what I found out about Worley noise is that it's actually great to generate the uh, de uh, Terrain details. Because if you apply it like to mountains, they get uh, really nice uh, ridges and, and uh, natural looking structures. But the thing is when you apply whirly noise on a larger scale, it kind of separates the map into these uh, little cells and junks uh, and players can like have trouble reaching it, each other because they are not enough uh, connection points between these cells. Though that's ultimately why I couldn't use that one. Just already wrote in, in the chat because my internet is dying all the time uh, that we need to conclude the session because uh, we, we need to have some break um, um, because the next session is starting in five minutes. So thanks again, Peter. And if anybody has any question, I, I'm sure you can connect to him by Discord or anything. Um, sure. So this concludes the session. Thanks, everybody.